So I am thrilled to introduce today's presenter, Susan T. Evans, who has more than 20 years of experience with communications and marketing in higher ed, and joined M. Stoner after a 22-year tenure at the College of William & Mary. As Director of Creative Services at William & Mary, she successfully led a team of 13 professionals, oversaw the college's online presence and print publications, and managed the creative vision, scope, and planning for campus-wide marketing and communications. As a strategist at M. Stoner, Susan works with institutions on websites, print, social media, and content strategy projects. And some of her recent clients include the American University of Paris and SUNY. During today's session, you can tweet to Susan at Susan T. Evans or to me at Mallory Wood. And don't forget our hashtag is going to turn this session over to you. I'm going to turn it started. Great. Thank you. It's really great to be here. I've really been looking forward to this session. I'm coming to you today from my living room in Williamsburg, Virginia. And um, I think that as I was preparing, what, what I realized was this, this topic brings out my directness, which is probably what is going to make, make it a lot of fun for you. But I'm also wondering, do I really want Mallory to be recording everything I'm saying? And then, of course, there's the back channel. But you know, we're just going to have to go with it and realize that I've worked at a lot of different organizations for a lot of different companies and institutions, so the examples that I give are not necessarily uh, drawn from any particular place. So I'm going to dive right in and go ahead and turn on my presentation, and we are going to get started. All right, Susan, so... I can confirm that we can see your slides. You can? Yes. Good. That's great. Super. Okay. So, in fact, um, I've been driven mad by the six challenges that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I've been working for a really long time. I actually graduated from college 32 years ago, so I've had a lot of different jobs. I've been an HR director, I've been a compensation manager, I've been an IT director, and I've been a director of creative services. So I've experienced all of this firsthand. So please don't think that I'm talking about something that I'm not aware of. So for instance, I've had bosses shut down my ideas. Um, I've had people tell me that I'm too young to know what the best course of action would be for a particular problem. And I've even had people question my integrity to get their own way. So I understand sort of what we're all facing as we try to do excellent work despite some pretty significant challenges on our campuses. So here we are, here are all of us out there, some frustrated, some angry, some disappointed, trying to do good work, right? Um, and I think no matter what type of college or university we're part of or whether we're part of an independent school, we face some really similar challenges. And we like to talk about those things when we get together. And that was sort of the inspiration for this presentation today was um, the kinds of themes that I would overhear as I met with people who work in education. So some days we're on our beautiful campus and the birds are singing and the flowers are gorgeous and the good guys are winning and things are going well and we're doing good work and we're proud of what we're accomplishing. And all's kind of right with the world. But then you go to one of those Groundhog Day again meetings where you're going to spend a couple of hours talking about the same topic that you've already talked about before and still didn't make any progress on. So um, it can be frustrating when that happens, and it starts to feel a little bit like this. There's this group of executives who need to be convinced, who you need to talk to, who need to understand your ideas. And then likewise, there's the internal stakeholders that you have to think about. There are your faculty, there are your staff, there are your current students and alumni. And then there's little old you with your idea trying to face these two giant um, barriers sometimes to, to moving ahead. So just as a refresher, the six things that we're going to be talking about today um, are committees, feedback, resources, change, turf, and relationships. And um, you all were kind enough to take a poll as we were starting to kind of let us know what was your top, uh, top pick of things that frustrate you the most. So Mallory, what are our top two results there? It was really interesting to see these results. Actually, 5% of the vote, those would be committees. So both got 25%, but coming in a close third was feedback at 20%. Okay, 
Okay, interesting. That's great to know. Thank you. All right, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be perhaps digging a little more on those two topics, and uh, we'll see how, how this goes and how much time we have. All right, let's talk about committees. So based on what I've seen so far, these things aren't going away. Um, they are unwieldy. Um, they're slow to act. I sometimes think they're set up to avoid making a decision. And even when you call a committee a task force, it still kind of operates the same way and presents a lot of the same challenges. So you really have to figure out how to use them well. It shows me that committee structures in higher education are being replaced by anything better. Um, so you've got to sort of live with it. So I want you to take a really close look at this room because this is the typical committee room and this is where the scope starts to creep on what it is you're talking about or the things that you're trying to decide. And this is where personal preferences are usually given more weight than any kind of data-driven decision making. And this is where everyone comes to spend an hour without deciding anything. And so when you think about committees, one of the things I think that happens is we make them too large. We have this sort of Noah's Ark two by two approach to our committees where every constituency, every department or unit or division or school or college has to have rep representation. And by the time you provide that level of representation on a committee, you've got something that is definitely unwieldy. Not only is it hard to schedule, but it's hard to get everybody in the room and you spend pretty much the whole time giving everybody a chance to say something and not necessarily making any decisions or taking any actions. So one of the things that I would recommend is that you should keep your committees small. Now that sounds pretty obvious. Probably you've already thought about that and you've already tried to do it. Um, but anything that you can do along that line I think is a good idea. One of the things that I've done that's been successful is I've tried to keep people off a committee by giving them an important way to give feedback in another manner. So for instance, before the committee is announced, before the membership is named, you go and you spend a couple of hours or maybe an hour talking to each of three people that you know are not going to be represented on that committee but would, a would ask to be if they thought that their feedback wasn't going to be taken. You spend a lot of time with those folks, you talk about what the committee work is going to be and you make it clear that you um, are going to be coming to them throughout the way for feedback and ideas and they're going to be a lot less likely to be concerned if they're not a member of that committee. And maybe you can even tell them that they'll be more effective outside the group and you realize how busy they are and how they may not be able to fit in just one more committee assignment. The other thing that I would mention about committees is that your first meeting is pretty much, you should think of it as just a meeting that's not going to accomplish anything. Um, really what you need to do at that first meeting is let people talk. As I've mentioned, we've got this two-by-two two Noah's Ark approach, so everybody comes with an agenda. Everybody comes with a group that they're trying to represent or a department that they want to speak for. So you need to let them have their say. You need to let them say what they came to say and really do a lot of listening in that first meeting and not expect to dive right into really important decision making or even any kind of agenda beyond just letting people talk. After that though, after everyone's had a chance to, uh, to have their say, the next meeting should be a lot more focused. Because what you really want to do is you want to go in with the best answers. Um, probably you guys already realize that the work that happens is not done in these committees. And the decisions that are made. And so when you go to that group as an advisor, what you want to go in with is a plan. You want to go in with a recommendation. You want to go in with anything but an open-ended question. If you go in with an open-ended question, you're inviting um, discourse <laughs> that's going to take a really long time. And so the best way to use these committees, in my opinion, is to go in with a recommendation that's pretty well fleshed out. You can even tell the committee that you've got a small team, a staff of people who are going to be staffing the committee and um, that you're going to be coming to them with ideas and suggestions and want to get their best thinking and advice on some of the recommendations that you have. So I'm thinking you're going to start to see a structure of my presentation. Um, I've got a summary for committees and a couple of these we've, we've already talked about. Um, doing a lot of listening at that first meeting and making sure that those future meetings have a pretty severely planned agenda <laughs> and um, a, a lot of uh, avoiding open-ended questions. But the other thing I think is relevant for committees is 
that you should make decisions if it's time to make a decision, even if somebody's missing from a meeting. Um, we all know what the academic calendar looks like on our campuses. We know when people use that as a reason not to attend a meeting or not to be part of a discussion. So, you know, let's go ahead and plan around that. The other thing that happens is, and again, I don't think you all are too naive to know this, there are people who don't show up at committees just so they don't have to be part of the decision making or they don't want to take a risk, they don't want to put a stake in the ground. And so they will delay your group if you continue to wait for them because number one, they're not going to show up the next time either. Um, so do what you can to keep your committee on track. Um, it's almost as simple as the reason meetings don't start on time is they don't start on time. So if you have an agenda that calls for a decision, that's the day you make the decision at that meeting. As long as everybody knows in advance, they'll make it a priority to be there. The other thing I think that's important for committees is repeating yourself. Um, that can be one of the most frustrating parts of work because you phrase, it, you phrase it well, you talk about something in a way that you think makes sense, and you expect people to take it the first time they said it, or, the, or, they, or they hear it, rather. It took me a really long time to learn that I've got to repeat myself over and over, because who am I to think that the first time I have an idea and the first time I present it to somebody, they're going to listen and hear it. So you have to say things over and over. In a committee, if you're leading the group, you have to remind them probably every meeting about what the scope of the effort is, what the charter is, what it is that you all are trying to do, and what is outside the scope of what the committee's work is. So don't be frustrated by having to repeat that to people. If you've made a decision, if um, there are certain parameters that have to be taken into account, repeat those. Um, people are looking for weakness. They're looking for some way in to get their agenda to be part of your agenda. And if you just continue to state what's already been decided or what the scope of the, uh, the effort already is repeatedly, they'll finally realize that you're not going to change your mind. All right, so my takeaway for committees, you'll find uh, I have a takeaway for each of the summary areas that I do. Committees are not where the work happens. Um, I feel almost relieved saying that because uh, I think a lot of us get get discouraged by the fact that nothing happens. Well, if you go in with that expectation, uh, it's a lot easier to manage. All right, let's uh, move on to the next topic. Ooh, before oh. we move on, Susan, I actually sure. have a question for you from Twitter and actually okay. a tweet I wanted to share with you as well. So at Smug JLM has told us that he sits on 19 committees. Crazy. That's crazy. And he said to be fair, but um, he points out that meetings mean productivity to a lot of people. And I wanted to share that with at Scott Dot, who's wondering, would you advocate Or is that too rude? I think it depends on your group to do it at that first meeting. Um, I, what I do find, though, is that things that you do to keep the meeting on track feel rude to you. But there are at least half of the people in the room that you are keeping the me meeting moving. And they may not show it. Um, hmm. So things like setting a timer might be a little bit too direct even for me. Um, I have been known on several occasions to go into an, a meeting with an agenda and next to each item it says 10 minutes to discuss this. Um, when that wasn't specific enough, I went in to the meeting with an agenda that said 9.05 to 9.15 we discussed this topic. And then I usually start the meeting by say, saying, you know, we have a lot we need to accomplish. Um, we have heard a lot of the information that we need to hear. It's time to make some decisions. So I'm going to do my best to keep us on track. Um, hope you don't think it's rude, but I know we all want to get out of here and, and move on to the rest of our day. So again, um, the things that you do might feel rude, but I think they work, and most of the people who are in the room are happy that you're doing them. And Chris Landry's wondering, do you have any thoughts on breaking down larger committees into subcommittees or specific task groups? Do you think that's effective? What I um, what's often effective is to have one or two. You should be one of those two people who are sort of staff to that committee. Um, to stop what seems to be an unending 
say, hey, how about two of us take that offline and take into account every we'll come back next time to respond to. So I think that's a that's definitely a way to um, get things moving and um, get so awesome. okay well to uh, to feed is one that that uh, and dear to most people's hearts. Um, it sometimes feedback loop get it to stop um, and often you spend not from the target audience, but instead that is really preferences from, from your internal stakeholders. And it can really feel a lot like this. It really feels like a fire hose. Um, everyone has something. And um, of course, there's always this, this problem with the loudest person um, never being from the target audience and uh, for whatever it is that you're doing. So it can, it can be a challenge. I have three really important rules for feedback that I sort of keep running through my head. The first is not all feedback's equal. So feedback that you get that are, that's clearly somebody's preference is not equal to feedback you get from a target audience. A second rule for me is not all feedback requires a response. And if you feel it does require a response, the response can be Thank you for your feedback. Um, the third uh, rule for me around feedback is not all feedback requires an immediate action. I think we are sort of, um, our culture tells us that somebody gives us feedback, we have to respond. Somebody gives us feedback, we have to make a change. Again, you're collecting data. You're collecting information. Thank you for your feedback. Be calm. Follow the plan. Don't make any quick changes just because you hear from one or two people. This is a classic thing in higher ed. I remember when I used to work for IT at William & Mary, we would have a problem and people would be panicking about it. You know, maybe the network was down or there was a problem with email and they'd want to communicate. And um, I'd say, well, how many people called? Oh, we had so many calls. There were so many people who were concerned about this. And then you find out that there maybe were four. And if you're the person answering the phone, and you hear the anger from four people on the other side of the line, it's understandable why you think that's a lot. But uh, we really need to pause and not necessarily do a knee-jerk reaction every time we get some feedback. The other thing that I think is important is, you know, some of the feedback is worth hearing. Um, feedback's gotten a bad rap, and um, it really is a way for you to get a lot of detail. Make sure you're really following the right course. And you know, you can make your idea better that way. People can really rip off what you're, you're planning and make it an even better, an even better project, which might make, make it more successful. So keep in mind that some of what you're hear, gonna be hearing is, is definitely worth hearing. The other thing is that you need to set the stage. You're responsible for structuring the feedback that you get. So you need to frame it in a way that's going to be useful to you. If you leave people to their own devices and expect them to understand what feedback will be helpful to you, they're going to give you personal preferences sometimes. So I would avoid these open-ended questions like, what do you think of this design? Or um, how do you like this possibility of something we could do in the future if everybody agrees to it? So again, the way that you ask for feedback and the way that you structure it is really This is what you're going to get. You're going to get things like the dean doesn't like green, um, which is not really very helpful to you in the, in the bigger picture. So it's best to ask a question in a way that's pretty concrete. Um, so for instance, using an example of design concepts because they seem to elicit the most interesting feedback, um, if you're looking at a set of design concepts and you want people to respond to them, ask them something concrete. Don't, don't say, what do you think about this color palette? Instead say, which of the two designs conveys the best that we have a varied research agenda that our faculty are involved in and that we have exceptional academics here? So again, trying to phrase the, the question in a way that you're going to get feedback that you can actually act upon and avoid somebody's personal preferences. Um, the other couple of other things that are useful in this feedback summary is, as we finish this one up, um, beware of her behavior is when a bunch of individuals get together and start acting differently than they would have if they were by themselves. 
Um, so I feel that sometimes surveys, um, individual phone calls, individual meetings with people, you're going to get better feedback because they're going to tell you what they think and they're not going to be influenced by what they hear other people say. So something that may not even be important to them, they decide is important if the most highly paid person in the room thinks it's a problem. So again, getting um, individualized feedback can be pretty important. And then final piece of advice, don't be paralyzed by what people tell you. Um, if you please everyone, you're going to please no one. So expect that you are going to tick people off, that they are not going to be happy with the choice that you made, but you're making a choice that's grounded in as much data as you can get. Um, I kind of skipped through that third bullet there, ground your presentation of your idea in feedback and data. Super, super important uh, to you hear from them to say something along the lines of, we tested this with our target audience and you know 25% of them thought that we needed to do X or 90% of them thought that it was a really way, great way to represent what it is we're trying to communicate. So always, always grounded in data. My takeaway for feedback, because I love to say it and you guys need to remember it. Thank you for your feedback. All right, let's talk about resources. Um, I'm looking at time, making sure we're going to get through it all. Okay, resources. So another week, another new task, another set of responsibilities, another unfunded mandate. Um, so what happens in higher ed is that we take on more because we have to. Somebody asks us to, or it's fun, or it's interesting, or it's a great idea. But we rarely stop doing the less valuable work that we've always done. And we really need to make that stop. There is no way we can sustain this level of more with less, and less with less, and less with more, or whatever it is you want to call it. So. Here's some ideas about that. So we're, not, we're just not good at this. Um, we're going to drag along with us everything that we've always done, no matter whether there's value in it, no matter whether we know we need to stop doing it, no matter whether we, anybody even notices that we're doing it anymore. And essentially, the bottom line on this is it takes courage. You have to gulp and stop. And sometimes you shouldn't ask, and you definitely shouldn't point out that you've stopped doing X or Y. Now I realize that not everybody's in a situation where they can get away with that. Um, you, may, you may have uh, the, uh, the executive vice president's pet project on your list of things that you can't stop doing. So a couple of other ideas. Use your powers of persuasion. Try to help people understand why you think there's no value in doing something. Now, I understand that means you've got to go out and collect some data about whether or not something's valuable. But that's a lot less time consuming that you know isn't really providing much. So try to use powers of per persuasion and use data to help make your case. The other thing I think you can do is swap what they want for something else that they want. Um, so I can remember a scenario where there was a print piece that everyone agreed was not a good idea except for the person who was doing this print piece. And um, even the person's boss thought the print piece should go away. Um, and so what I did was I said, hey, we can't do this print piece for you anymore, but we will build a website with all this information. We'll let you take a look at it. We'll show you how to maintain it into the future. So I was able to swap something that they also wanted for something that they didn't want uh, quite as much. And then there's always the make them pay for it. Now I know it's hard on a campus to charge back people for stuff, but if you're doing that already, um, the things that you want to stop should become more expensive because they are not adding as much value and you want to discourage people from doing them. Another way that I think you can get more resources is building on your success. You should be regularly updating your leadership about what your team is accomplishing um, through your boss, through your boss's boss, sometimes it's an email, sometimes it's a six-month report. But you should really be making it clear to people on campus what your team is contributing. Because when you have momentum on your side and you have some successes that you can build on, people will pay a lot more attention to you when you ask for resources. They'll also pay more attention when you tell them that you need to stop doing certain things. Um, but excellent work begets excellent work. So keep up doing the hard work, pointing people to the direction of the things that you've accomplished, and then uh, taking advantage of that. So timing is everything, too, when you're talking about asking for resources. Um, great success is a great time to ask for more. Um, when people are, when you're riding high and people think you've accomplished a lot, it's a good time to say, you know, we could also do X. 
if we had an additional team member or if we could hire a part-time worker. The other thing that's conversely true, don't ever waste a good crisis. Um, when things aren't going well and there's a crisis, sometimes your leadership will pay a lot more attention to your request for resources than they do when things are going well. Um, seems, I guess, a little bit manipulative to take advantage of the crisis, but as long as you're trying to be part of the solution for that crisis, I think it's okay. Um, another thing that I think is important as we talk about resources is at the end of the day, sometimes you're not going to get any more. Or sometimes it's going to be two years before you get any more. Or sometimes you need to do a project even though you don't have sufficient resources. And to that I say, you need a resource. You need a team that can adapt, can have skills that are chameleon-like so that they can be part of whatever you need to do. Some of that comes from who you hire and the flexibility put in place, shaping your team and helping them to become what you'll need from them in the future. And believe me, I know firsthand how difficult this can be, but um, if you hire people who are smart and flexible and capable and curious, they will be interested in work that doesn't fall within the current range of their job descriptions. And if you try to put as many of those people as you can on a team, even if the team includes some folks who, you know, you know, poor old Rose who's been around for 50 years and doesn't really want to do anything different than what she did 25 years ago, um, sometimes the new folks, the colors of the new folks will rub off on the, uh, the folks who you're trying to, trying to influence. Um, for me, I know a lot of people talk about um, professional development when we get to talking about people and teams, and believe me, I think workshops are great, training's great, webinars are great, but really what changes people's skills and abilities is giving them work that requires them to have new skills and abilities. There is nothing like having a project with a deadline, with a particular goal in mind that will help people roll up their sleeves and find out how to get something done. And yeah, you set them up for success. You partner them with somebody who knows what they're doing. You partner them with somebody who has a skill that you want them to have more of. But there are ways to use the work um, as a means for elevating everyone's um, skills and abilities. And I think that the best leaders take advantage of that. So resources, again, a couple of things I've already mentioned, including gulping and stopping and uh, not asking for permission and timing. Um, but of course, you can't talk about resources without talking about that last bullet, and that is cheap, good, fast, pick two. Um, you know, not necessarily something you'd say to the VP, but you can get that message across using different words. Sometimes we have more money than we have time. Sometimes we have more time than we have money. Um, sometimes we have neither, but we at least have to help people understand as you start what they're sacrificing if they're asking you for something that's cheap and fast um, and not necessarily good. So take away for resources. Stop and see if anyone notices. Uh, again, so far I haven't gone to a campus where somebody said to me, you know what, we've got all kinds of money. It's all in, in big old bags around here and we've got enough to do whatever you need. So tell us what resources we need to spend on communications and marketing. So pretty much all of us have to figure out a way to stop doing the stuff that adds less value and uh, hopefully nobody notices. Let's talk about change. That's a big one. Um, we're pretty good at digging in in the academy, right? Uh, almost any amount of change. Um, is needed though for any great idea and so we have to really push past this with our stakeholders and I'm gonna move through this one fairly quickly because I want to get to the, some of the ones that you thought were more interesting um, you know it the, we, you miss Kansas you know change is coming we're human um, we're worried about what's coming next so it's important for you to talk about the business needs it's important for you to talk about what's good for the whole and I know that doesn't always go over well with people in fact, what, I, what usually goes over best with people is discussion about what's in it for them. And, you know, take advantage of that. The best kind of communication is personal communication. So tell me what this means for me, tell me why this is good for me, and I'll start to understand what it is that you're trying to get me to do. Um, at the end of the day, sometimes people are afraid of more work. You know, they have the limited resources and the limited staff and the, the 
you know, increasing number of, of demands just like you do. So they're trying to protect themselves. The best strategy is the, the, the school down the street, so keeping up with the Joneses. Um, sometimes if your school is doing and it's a, you know, it's a peer or it's a competitor, um, all of a sudden the idea that you have doesn't seem so risky anymore and uh, sounds like something that we maybe should try. So keep up, uh, keeping up the Joneses is something certainly to, to use to your advantage. Um, I also think what's important with change is to understand that you need the big blue sky thinking, but you also need to be down in the weeds enough that people can kind of grasp onto what you're trying to do. So it's hard for people to imagine the future. I mean, you might know what it's like in your head and you know what you're trying to accomplish, but you need to give them enough of the details so that they aren't nervous about it and know that it's going to be good. And that can be something as concrete as making a prototype as real as possible, using real language, using photography that's real, not in place photos, trying to take away all the barriers to them imagining something better and something great. So change, we've talked about this, um, see what the personal benefits are, make those clear, be direct about the greater good and what business needs there are. And you know, and again, enough details to make the future state uh, acceptable. But um, at some point, executives need to step in. I mean, executive leaders perhaps will need to put down a hammer to, to get change to occur. You know, you'll have exhausted all of the charm and persuasion and other capabilities that you have, and it's time for somebody to say, hey, this is just the way we're going to do it. To what we already have, why did we start this thing? And then you pause. You have to say this out loud sometimes, and you have to pause. And sometimes it's enough to get people um, moving. All right, turf and uh, relationships are what are, is left, and I know that you all had some interest in that. So interest in that. So turf. Um, I know we call it silos, but um, I really think that's a softer way to say way to say turf. We're really talking about um, protecting our interests of our units or our own budget or something like that. And I think we need to turn our attention towards what's best for our customers, not what's best for our organizational charts. So we aren't farmers, but uh, silos always come up when uh, three or more higher ed people gather together. Um, and I think silos, as I said, is a really nice way to talk about turf because really what you're protecting is your staff and your budget and your way of doing things. Um, this is particularly evident when everybody wants the same thing, wants more video for your website. And instead of pooling all the money that people are spending individually on small website projects for their departments, and not really getting what they need, if they were to pool all those funds centrally and let somebody manage that for video and media production, they would get great results. But everybody's afraid to give up their budget, to give up their control, to work for the greater good. So that's where the barriers come in. Some ways that you can work around this is um, you need to be coordinating. If you're in marketing and communications at your institution, you need to be coordinating with everyone who has communications in their title. Um, you know, I've been places where if you got everybody in the room who had the word communications in the title, you might have 75 or 200 people show up. That's a big team. That's a lot of people who can be working on your behalf. A little bit of coordination are done. Um, I also recommend working at the grassroots level. Um, VPs, talk to VPs. I understand that. But if you can talk to somebody who can influence another VP and you all can get on the same page, you can go to those two with, a, with an approach that you both already agree to. It seems a lot less risky, and it seems a lot more like collaboration and a lot less like losing turf. Um, I do think it's important to focus on goals and measures for success as a way to, to get people to break out of their thinking of, well, our department has always done that, so that department doesn't need to be involved. So th these are ways to start having, having these conversations. Um, doesn't always work, but sometimes when you talk about students and you make the student experience very personal and very real for these most turf-involved people, um, even they have a hard time saying no to a student and, and doing something that they know is completely contrary to what the, this, a more successful student experience might be. 
So my takeaway for turf, uh, I had a boss say this to me once, and uh, I have remembered it a lot, and it's a really good piece of advice. You don't have to be right. You just have to get what you want. So as you're negotiating silos and turf, keep in mind that you might not ever get credit. No one will say to you, wow, that was a really great idea. I'm so glad you came to us with that. It doesn't matter. As long as you get what you want, as long as you're able to build those bridges and do something great, that's what counts. Let's talk about relationships. I'm really thrilled that um, silos and relationships came up as something that you guys were interested in because I figured relationships would be a surprising addition to this list. Um, I think it should always be a factor. People help other people. People give to other people. People listen to other people. So the relationship that you have with people on campus, whether they're your peers, members of your team, senior leaders, and your boss, is never a waste of time. It's always good to spend time making those relationships strong because you're going to need those people and they're, they're going to be a lot more responsive if the relationship is a, is a really positive one. Now, um, my first piece of advice to you on this front is that people will disappoint you if you let them. I know it sounds really cynical, but what I'm trying to say is um, you should follow up with people. If you need something for them, from them, if you're waiting for something from them, if you know that you need them to act before you can get to the next level with a particular thing that you're working on, you should ping them. You should remind them. And even though you shouldn't have to, they're grown-ups and they get up every day and get dressed and go to work, um, the fact that you need something from them, you should just go ahead and make that happen, even if it means that you are having to remind them about something that they should already be doing on their own. Again, people will disappoint you. Make sure that they act, even if it means you have to uh, cajole them a little bit. Of course, it's always difficult when the relationship um, that might be a little rocky or a little difficult is your boss. Um, and sometimes that person can disappoint you. Uh, sometimes your boss can be the biggest barrier to what you're trying to accomplish. And I'm not trying to stand up for bosses everywhere, but uh, I think you, you have to understand the mindset. I think middle managers are often in a position where they have to filter every decision based on the personal risk that it means for them. So they don't have enough power and authority to protect themselves. And they have to be really careful about the decisions that they make. And so sometimes the status quo is easier. Sometimes they're really good managers of people. And I think understanding that goes a long way to helping you communicate with individuals like that. Um, what do you do? You persuade them. You go in and you make the best case. You talk about how much you want to do a particular thing, how much you are ready to do that, how strong the team is that you have in place, how important it will be for the institution, how good it will make you look when we're successful at this, and I know we can be successful. So persuasion is one tactic that I think works well um, with your boss, if your boss is part of the problem in terms of relationships. The other thing that you can do if you don't have a great boss to work with is ride the coattails of a visionary. Find somebody on campus who is shaking things up, who is coming in and maybe is a brand new leader on your campus, maybe is in a honeymoon period where everybody's listening. So volunteer to work with that person. Find a way to be on a committee they're on. Find a way to talk with them about an idea you have. I understand you have to be careful about this because you don't want to look like you're going around your boss, but you to start talking to things, especially where all of the decision makers are and can speak on your behalf, it's a really good idea. So some things around relationships, again, don't wait, people, wait for people to do what they said they were going to do and you know they're not going to do. They need to be reminded. Um, step into the role. You know, I've been in situations where I was kind of hesitant or less than confident, and all of a sudden I realized everybody in the room was looking at me going, hey, you know, you're in charge. Go ahead and tell us what we need to do. Um, so sometimes, believe it or not, riding the wave of prior successes and stepping into your role as the expert is the thing to do. I also think, and this is related to some other um, slides that we've already talked about, but I think it's roles 
and understand the ideas. And if your boss is the problem, you need to just get over it. So my takeaway on relationships is someday that person might be your boss. Particularly true in higher ed, where people hang around for a while, we stay around for a while, things are slow to change. Um, this has happened to me twice. Two people that I had the opportunity to burn bridges with, and um, it must have been, you know, Jiminy Cricket on my shoulder that told me not to do that because I've certainly burned bridges in my day. Um, I took the high road instead, and later that person became my boss. So that's my takeaway for you today. All right, so we are going to wrap up because I want to allow um, some time for questions. I want to start by saying we've covered all six of these things, and I want to leave you with a little bit of inspiration. And I want to say that what you need to do every day is believe in your inner lion. So, you know, being internally motivated and confident about what you bring to a situation or to a challenge goes a long way. Um, I read a blog post this week. I'll, I'll tweet it out later. But there's this woman re was referring to, you know, those kind of negative me messages that run through our heads all the time that kind of keep us from taking risks and keep us from being confident enough. She called that the itty shitty bitty, no, itty bitty shitty committee in her head. And I thought that is so true. Um, we need to turn those voices off. The common denominator in all of these situations is you. Don't let the circumstances on your campus give you a convenient excuse for not going for the excellence. Uh, I think sometimes we do that. I think we, we think, ah, this will never happen. It will never work. I'm just going to forget about it. Don't do that. Be your own advocate over and over. And um, before I start sounding like a TV preacher, I'm going to stop and uh, see from all of you. Yes, Susan, that was awesome. Thank Good. you. Good. Um, I want to share a few of my favorite tweets. Um, before I do that, I just want to remind our attendees that we will have a very short survey once you log out of the webinar. If your pop-up blocker is off, it'll just appear on the screen. And uh, your mm -hmm. feedback is really valuable. It helps us determine future webinar topics. It gives Susan a sense of how she did and if this webinar met your expectations. And as we're finalizing the 2014 plan for our webinars, your feedback is particularly helpful today. So just a little mm. plug for that. So a couple of my favorite tweets. One came from Scott Dot. To shake the challenge of committees, we try to keep our teams as small as possible, often as small as three people. I like love that. It. Love it, love yeah. it. Yeah. Eric Bolson tweeted that he loves Kyle Bowen, who works at Purdue. He loves his two pizza rule. If <laughs> that's that's really good. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Meg Costello tweeted a little while ago that she's been vigorously nodding throughout this entire webinar Aww. over the humanity of higher ed. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, I thought that was all really great. So we do have a few questions, Susan, and I'm sure some more are going to be coming in on Twitter. So I'm going to be, I have another screen over here for anyone who's not sure why I keep looking in this direction. But I'll be checking Twitter as you're answering some of these questions. Um, but the first one is, what happens when the visionary doesn't have the political power to uh, affect change? Um, you know, the project is at risk. I mean, you know, I, I started doing project management when I was in IT at William & Mary, and at the time, the, the literature in the IT discipline, the IT vertical, was that 50% of IT projects failed. Um, so I think we have a, this expectation that every project is going to be successful, every initiative is going to be successful, and they're not going to be. Um, if you don't, if you have a visionary who doesn't have enough it, the, the effort is at risk. Now that's why sometimes a partnership between, you know, the provost or the president or whoever the, you know, Big Joe on campus or Big Jane on campus happens to be, a partnership between that visionary and somebody says, okay, I know this visionary, I like what they have in mind and I'm going to protect them from um, what might keep this project from being successful. So sometimes you can partner that visionary with somebody who does have the political clout. But it's, a, it's definitely a concern within higher ed. Um, and it's sometimes something that even no amount of hard work can get around. I um, was part of a failed project. And I still, like right now, I still get a pit in my stomach every time I talk about it. So I know exactly how you feel about that. 
So we just got a question come through from the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. And just a reminder, folks, if you want to verbally ask a question, um, just use the raise your hand feature and we'll unmute you. Um, so this person says, I have a staff member that's located physically away from the rest of the team on campus, in addition to being someone who's resistant to recent pushes for change and restructuring. Any thoughts on language or practices that might help bring this person along? Yeah, the first thing is that person needs to be physically located with the rest of the team. And maybe that's not possible, but it's really, I mean, take it from somebody who knows, I work in my home every day. And um, it's really difficult <laughs> to be part of the action when you're not physically located with people. And it doesn't mean it's not possible, it's 100% possible to do, but it has to be a factor that you think about an individual who's not integrated into the team in the way that you need them to, they definitely need to be working with the rest of the group because it takes away the ability to kind of hide out and, and not change. Um, the other thing that I think is really important with change, and especially when you're working with people and you want them to change, you can't just talk about it to, it to them once. You can't just go to them once and say, hey, I want to talk to you about um, the fact that you don't really seem interested in this new initiative that we have, and and um, it's really important to all patients. But they're not going to change after that first conversation. You've got to go back every week. You've got to be essentially priorities are in a way that they cannot ignore. I know it's uncomfortable. I know it requires time on your part. But think of not maybe um, keeping you from getting done what you need to get done or being the, the sort of snickle fritz in the room that, that keeps all the ideas from being good ones. So, yeah, and understand them to task maybe even every day um, before you'll see any change is, is a good. Susan, what's number seven on? Oh boy, you know, I, when I first started eating, I thought there's the time we have, so I went down to six. But seven for me would be um, leadership because, and I've been looking for a presentation to say this in, and now here it is. Um, every problem in an organization or institution, in my opinion, is tied to leadership. So it's, you know, leadership takes time and effort and spending and commitment. And pretty much everything that goes wrong can be tied to leadership and everything that goes right can be. We need more um, leaders in our institutions and more people who understand the value of leadership. And I don't mean just like being in charge. I am grow and change and being a good listener and thinking about new ideas and not always being the smartest person in the room. So. I think um, we could do a whole session on leadership. And, you know, Mallory, you and I have been talking about what we should do for this 2014, uh, the rest of our webinar series. And, you know, based on the, the reactions I think we're getting and some of the questions we're getting, I think we could do more on team development and leadership development and, um, you know, web governance and, and communications and marketing governance on campuses. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that the poll results really told us, you know, what people are interested in hearing about. And a lot of the, the conversation that's been taking place on Twitter, Susan, I think really supports that idea, too. I know you're going to go take a look at that as soon yeah. as we wrap up here. Um, but I think that's a great idea. So, folks, you heard it here first, right? It sounds like <laughs> we're probably going to develop. It'll take some time. Development. Yeah, it it, it's it not going to be next It can't month. be next month, but, Mallory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A little later this year, I think that's actually a really good idea. So um, awesome. And so please let us know when you fill out that exit survey if that's a topic you'd be interested in hearing about because we'll make sure that we follow up with you directly if it is. Um, Susan, that's it for the questions today. Thanks okay. so much for such a wonderful session. Um,